Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this organic chemistry video introduces the SN1 substitution mechanism. In addition to the SN2 mechanism that was covered earlier, another important mechanism in substitution chemistry for alkyl halides is the SN1 mechanism. Here, the S stands for substitution, that means a portion of the molecule is going to be substituted for by a, another portion. The N stands for nucleophilic, that means that a nucleophile is going to be taking the place of the group that's leaving. And then one means first order or unimolecular. That means that only one molecule is involved in the rate limiting step. It doesn't mean the number of total steps because SN1 mechanism actually requires two steps. Here's an example of a reaction that goes by the SN1 mechanism. We have an alkyl halide here that's tertiary and a nucleophile here that's weak. These are rather poor conditions for an SN2 mechanism, but as we're gonna learn, these are ideal conditions for an SN1. So clearly this is a different mechanism than we've seen in the past. The result is a substitution product where the bromine has been replaced by the OCH3. This slide is going to cover the SN1 substitution mechanism in detail. In our example here, we have our tertiary alkyl bromide, and in the first step, this is the slow step, the leaving group is going to leave. This is a difference from the SN2 mechanism where the leaving group left and the nucleophile attacked in a single step. In this mechanism, the bromine leaving group leaves, and that generates an intermediate called a carbocation. It is a rather unstable reactive intermediate. There's a central carbon that's sp2 hybridized and has a formal positive charge. In the second step, which is the fast step, the nucleophile is going to attack. So here, a pair of electrons on our nucleophile, which in this case is methanol, is going to attack the carbocation carbon. This gives a new bond between the oxygen and the carbocation carbon, which gives this substrate, where the oxygen is now making a bond to the carbon. Notice at this point that the oxygen still has its proton attached. In a final step, there'll be a proton transfer reaction where some kind of weak base, in this case the best weak base in the mixture is this methanol molecule, will come by and pluck that proton off. That'll give a neutral substitution product and an acid base product. The SN1 mechanism is really two steps. This last step is simply a proton transfer step. In this mechanism, the first step is rate limiting. The slow step is forming the carbocation. Once the carbocation forms, the second step, attack of the nucleophile, is fast. The reaction overall is first order, or unimolecular. Only the alkyl halide participates in the rate limiting step. Since the first step is the slow step, the entire process depends on this first step. What happens in the second step doesn't affect the overall rate. Therefore, the concentration of the nucleophile doesn't affect or impact the rate at which the reaction proceeds. The rate law for SN1, therefore, is rate constant times only the concentration of the alkyl halide. Notice that there's no nucleophile component here because the nucleophile doesn't get involved in the rate determining step. This is a difference from SN2. We can graph the energy changes that happen in an SN1 mechanism where reaction coordinate or time is on the x-axis and energy is on the y-axis. And here I've chosen to use kilojoules per mole as my unit for energy. Reactants are shown here and they proceed to give a carbocation in the first step. We can mark the energies of the starting materials the alkyl halide and the nucleophile, as well as the carbocation and the nucleophile using these lines, and then draw an arc to indicate the energy transitions that occur in this reaction going from the starting materials to the reactive intermediate. Notice there's a hump here. That is our transition state for this reaction, which isn't shown on this slide, but you can imagine it as being a species where the bond between carbon and bromine is half broken. Then if we extend a reference line out from the starting materials and measure the distance between that energy level and the height of the highest hump here, the transition state, that'll give us E sub A1. That is the activation energy of the first step for forming the carbocation intermediate. Then the second step involves the nucleophile attacking the carbocation to give the substitution product. And I can draw a line to indicate the energy of those final products here and draw an arc that shows the energy transitions as it goes from carbocation to product. Similarly, I can draw a reference line here, measure the distance between the carbocation energy and the height of the second hump, which is the transition state for the second reaction, and label that E sub A2. That's the activation energy of the second step of the mechanism. If you look at the differences between E sub A1 and E sub A2, E sub A1 is quite a bit bigger, and that is why it ends up being the rate determining step. This is a higher energy barrier, and that makes the first step much slower. The other thing you can do is measure the distance between energies of the starting materials 
and the products. And so I added a reference line here and I'm measuring the distance between those energies and that is the delta G of the reaction. That can be used to determine an equilibrium constant.